All right, the room is jazzed. Um, this is the coveted uh, final spot of the conference after the two-hour lunch, the, the, the spot everybody uh, wants. But I'll, I'll just start by talking a little bit about, uh, about the, uh, what, how we usually have our meetings, and then we can, uh, you know, we usually keep the agenda pretty light. And uh, as with the other SIGs, uh, we can just kind of uh, talk about particular issues that we're having, uh, potentially bugs, and uh, just some of the unique things that you face when uh, you're a consortia. And uh, I was talking to uh, Brendan last night, and he was pointing out maybe uh, it'd be helpful to de define consortia. And in the case of Koha, it's really anything that's multi-branch. So uh, if you have two branches, that kind of makes you a consortia in the eyes of Koha because it complicates how you have to do things when you're not standalone. So uh, we might be adding, or at least uh, making this more of a, talking about this as not just consortia, but also multi-branch, so people understand that anytime you have more than one branch in Koha, you have kind of a unique set of circumstances from a standalone library. Uh, so typically we meet on Thursdays, I forget off the top of my head which particular one, the fourth Thursday, yeah, that sounds right. And uh, that is every other month. So it's not a monthly meeting. So this is actually right about normally when we would be doing it. Uh, so in a couple of months, we'll, uh, we'll have another one. And um, so uh, that's kind of the intro. Um, does, I will open it up and walk to you with the mic. Does anybody have any consortial stuff that they wanted to discuss in the room? Uh, if there is not, then I can always talk about my ongoing holds project that every, you know, that is the saga that everybody wants to hear, hear uh, the next chapter of the story. But uh, here comes Christopher. So I'll go ahead and bring up the topic that I brought up at the last consortium, uh, not consortium, but the last SIG meeting that I was uh, told, oh, we're not gonna cross those lines. Uh, but uh, it would be a fantastic thing if we could, uh, I think, if not this group, but at least individuals contributing to some sort of list that we maintain uh, for developers to kind of be on the radar about uh, preferences or um, settings within Koha that are troublesome for consortia, particularly those that are just you know all or nothing kind of settings uh i know that it's you know ever since we've been in koha there have been things that that have uh, been kind of road blockers for consortia and we've had to do trade-offs because you know we can only turn it on or turn it off or you know it's it's very limited in its scope of what you can do i know that you know the more uh, granular we are the better we can configure Koha, but it also makes it more complex. But if we can put those things down and keep those on uh, their radar, I think that would be a big help to them. I think if we can list what it is and why it's a roadblocker for consortia, I think that would be a good communication tool for them. Yeah, so I'm just thinking of an example that uh, I get asked about a lot. And right now you can set uh, when your items go to long overdue lost, but that is a, one of those global settings, which means uh, for our consortia, we have, um, we have like a hundred and over a hundred branches set up. And that means everybody has to have the same one when they might have a policy they want to be different than that. Ours is currently set at uh, 45 days, I believe. Uh, so or maybe it's 60, something like that. But uh, that, but that is true for everyone. So that that's an example of something that would be if there was some flexibility in that, then we could give the option uh, for different libraries to do that. So I imagine that would just be different crons that would have to get set up versus just using the single one that's in the system preferences. But I know uh, that's one that I, I think. Uh, it's not like a deal breaker or anything, but it is annoying to libraries that they have to go along with whatever uh, we've set. And um, and I know our consortium doesn't really have a, a real good 
apparatus to uh, say, we all want to change that. We're voting uh, to make that different. We don't, we haven't really done that. So uh, does anybody else have any examples of a system preference that's global? Jason does. I'll go to you. You don't need to see me. Um, my my the system preference that came up recently was check previous checkout. Um, so that's like when you go to checkout, it'll look through the patron's circulation history and then notify you if they've had it before. Um, some libraries that want it, some libraries that don't. And we're worried that if we turn it on globally, some people won't realize that they need to like click through a block before that thing actually gets checked out because um, that's a common problem. So that one's for me. Does anybody else have uh, a system setting like that that you get asked about? I, I know if I went through them, I could easily identify a few more. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Uh, yes. Um, actually, it's more a question. Um, how would you see it implemented? Would it be like on the branch page, it would say, follow the system preference or this is the value? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought about this that I've actually, you know, that I'm prepared to submit a spec, but um, yeah, something like that. Or, I mean, it'd be fine because there's a lot of stuff we do where we're just like to our vendor, Bywater, can you set up a cron for this branch? We, we, I mean, that would be fine. It'd be nicer if it was actually something like on the, uh, on like a circ rules or the library page itself where you could uh, where you could configure that, uh, but yeah, that would be ideal. Kind of to address Carolyn's question, like one example I can think of is um, the the max fine threshold. Like, what's the maximum fine a patron can have before they're blocked? That's a global system preference. And I have some libraries that want that to be a dollar. I have some libraries that want that to be $10 and one, some libraries that want to, that to be 50, but because it's a system preference that's global. Um, but that would be a good one to have on the circulation rules page. So you could say for this library, it's a dollar. You know, that's, that's how a lot of these relate to or for circulation rules. Um, another example I can think of are um, borrower categories. Um, those you can create borrower categories and have a, like a category. We, we tried to trim everything down to where we've got adult child and a few others. Um, but, um, some libraries want the adult, uh, category to renew at a different, for a different time period. Um, some libraries want them to, you know, they're just differences there. And the way to get around that is to create adult this branch, adult, that branch, and then you end up with um, having to manage five bazillion <laughs> uh, different categories. And of course, for each category, then you have potentially different circulation rules at different libraries. And anything that adds to the number of po potential circulation rules, I figure I, I, those are the kinds of things that you know give me huge headaches. Because if a circulation rule can be defined by library collection code and borrower or library item typing and borrower category. And I have 51 libraries and 40 item types and um, 43 borrower categories. If I add like another, if I add like 20 borrower categories to each library, then, then the potential for, for crazy circulation rules goes through the roof. That's why whenever I see anything where somebody says, can we add collection code to the circulation rules matrix? It's like, God, no. <laughs> so a lot of those things, especially if they deal with circulation rules, if they could be moved to the individual library circulation rules, instead of being a global system preference, that's where I'd like them to be. So, and I'm sure that's where you are. Uh, yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I also heartily agree that adding a collection code uh, to make the, the circles exponentially more complex is not something I'm interested in. So 
I guess we would just always ignore that. But uh, if that ever happened. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, I, I generally I agree with George. Yeah, I think most of ours are circ type rules. One of the things that because well, we were on uh, Libline before coming over and that had not developed. So there's already a lot more of those less global uh, preferences in circles than we were used to when we migrated several years ago. So there's already a lot of that work being done, but I do think there are probably a few more areas where uh, that could be uh, uh, improved upon. Were there any other uh, particular system preferences anybody could think of? If not, we can move on to other topics. Christopher. Now, um, I wanted to, I threw up a, another bug that's been in since uh, 2020, I believe, um, which deals with uh, the OPAC and uh, multi-branches. That's uh, one thing that I have felt like uh, has been a little challenging. I was actually talking with Lucas about setting up multi-branches for our um demo instance and you know we were trying to figure out uh, figure out how we wanted to do that and it, it's kind of crawled to a stop for some reason but so i'm gonna have to pick that back up when i get back to to work but um you know back then um i was toying with the idea and i think owen had uh, chimed in on this and i need to i need to look at the bug again uh, because i had some other thoughts about it but uh, initially, I was thinking, you know, each library has a place to define an IP address, and it would be nice if at least if you put in an IP address that um, if uh, the OPAC saw that IP address, you know, it would do customizations based on that, that location. Um, another thought about customizing uh, the OPAC for, for per branch. Um, was to throw the uh, the library code in the URL somewhere um, so that you could define uh, each branch that way. Uh, I would love, you know, and this this is totally separate, but I would love for that kind of functionality to either the IP address or the uh, the URL with the library code in it um, to work for self check as well, because we we know that not all items that are done through the self-check or through one location. So, um, and we like to get statistics on, on the usage on those things. So, uh, but uh, using the IP address or a uh, URL uh, uh, inline code for the library would be a huge improvement for the OPAC and especially for customization between branches. Thank you. Any other bugs that uh, have come up recently? Okay, uh, now you have to get story time about my hold saga. And, and uh, uh, so the issue we've had was we have, uh, because we really value customization and Koha generally does a great job of that. We, not everybody has the same borrowing rules. So that, and also not every library is the same type. So we've got kind of two issues there because school libraries are not open year round. So they have to close and they can't be filling holds or anything like that. Uh, so what we had attempted to do was use branch transfer limits to uh, prevent holds from going through. But what we've found is that um, you can still place a hold. You just have to set the pickup location for the wrong place. Now, the state of Colorado is pretty big, so you very well may be uh, placing a hold on something that you're not supposed to receive that to pick up a, a, in a completely different part of the state. So our first attempt to stop this was using a little jQuery to pop up a message and um, that would say like, you probably don't wanna do this. Now we do have some, uh, some districts within our consortium, in which case that actually might be legit. So we can't completely prevent that from happening. So we have that message that shows up. 
that apparently is not a deterrence because we still have to uh, do that. Uh, there's still a lot of people that don't read the message and click through, which I, I kind of get. That makes sense. You know, you're just trying to place a hold for somebody and you're used to seeing things pop up. You don't you kind of get used to just hitting submit and not reading the actual message. So um, <clears throat> So what we've, uh, what I've been doing now is kind of a painstaking process because we have so many item types uh, because we, again, we have a lot of libraries, a lot of customizations. Uh, so I think what will work is if we create rules for uh, each that are consistent uh, for the most part, uh, let's say like these are the item types that don't lend and put that in every single branch. I, th I think that will go a long way. We also, based on a, a suggestion Jason had, I haven't done this yet, but um, we will be creating like for the libraries that choose not to lend DVDs, switching them to an item type that is like a non-lending, not non-lending outside of the uh, the branch DVD item type. And so, if those rules are all consistently placed, I think that at least based on my initial testing, that will kind of uh, supersede what we've been doing with the branch transfer limits. So then we just have to figure out what to do with, uh, with the libraries that, uh, that will be, that are closed for periods of time. And I think we can just turn off them as a pickup location and that should solve that piece. So I think those together are hopefully gonna work for us, but it's one thing uh, when we were at lunch, uh, Nick and I were uh, talking about this and he's kind of like, yeah, maybe we're doing something not the best with holds because it's so complicated and hard to figure out how to do things. So I know uh, some of the people in this room uh, have had conversations with me about different approaches and I, I, it's just hard with the different use cases, it's kind of hard to come to a consensus of how, how to make everything work. I think we all have some ideas on uh, things that would work better for our libraries, but I, I don't think we've quite reached that unified like this is going to solve all of our problems. So uh, fortunately, I think I've got, found a way to solve our problems. It's just painstaking to add like 35 uh, holds rules to over 100 libraries. So and there's no and because they're different, there's no easy way to programmatically just have that happen. So it's just taking some time to do that. But um, or at least there's no easy way to programmatically do that. But um, so I don't know if anybody else is having holds challenges that they're hoping to uh, to have solved. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, it's something that a couple of libraries have brought up in in our consortium recently was if there was a way to have holds go to the home library of the patron first before going elsewhere. And I understand why they're concerned about that because sometimes a hold may go to a library that's halfway across the state or halfway, several counties away, whereas the, whole, the item is actually in that patron's home library, but it just goes to a random library first. And, uh, but as far as I know, there's no good or easy way to, only branch transfer limits or something would be the best way, I think, but I don't think we want to get yeah, there, there. the local holds priority. Okay. And that's exactly what it does. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. So we we're a consortium of 53 libraries and uh, we've got the way we have holds set up right now is as soon as a patron places a hold, it goes on the hold queue to a random library and it doesn't matter whether it's, at that patron's home library or not. It just goes to a random library. And we had a couple of libraries asking about that because it seemed inefficient to them. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. Yes. <laughs> Do I want to do that? But local holds priority may be the answer. Okay. So I can explain how local holds priority works for us is we have it turned on 
And so we have 51 libraries um, and uh, like the library in Baser by this is this is a long stand this was a long standing complaint from the baser library is they order things well in advance and the new books would arrive and they would catalog them and immediately they would be shipped out of the library to fill holds at other places um even though there were patrons at baser that had uh hold requests that had placed requests on these items so what local holds priority does is that the first baser copy goes to the first the the patron from baser that's higher that's the highest up in the holds list. So, uh, and if it's, and, and it won't go anywhere else until all the baser holds have been filled. And then once all the baser holds have been filled, it'll go to other places. Um, and that's what local holds priority does. Um, and the transportation cost matrix, I, we haven't implemented that here in Northeast Kansas, but I have implemented that at, at uh, other libraries and what it does um, is you look at it's a it's a table in your case it would have 53 columns and 53 rows and you assign a value so that from from baser to for me it would be like from to send an item from baser to tonganoxy you give it a value and the the, the greater the value the harder it's going to be for that item to move between those branches so if there if you've got of 50 columns and they're all five, 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 and then one of them is 20, it's going to assign to the fives before it's going to assign to the 20. Um, that is really complex to sit up and to set up. The reason I haven't set it up for where I am now is because it won't take into consideration live days that libraries are closed. It, and you might now, but there are a lot of things that it doesn't take into consideration. There's a lot of issues that we have with the courier, like some libraries get courier service five days a week, some get three days a week. It doesn't, it can't take those kinds of things into consideration, which is why um, we aren't using it now. So for us, the reason, the biggest reason we don't use it is because the libraries closest to Kansas City, where we have the greatest population, they would be the ones that would be hammered all the time because that's where the most activity is. And we'd rather include some of those smaller libraries that are further away, get them to, to share items because the more, because that's what we're all about is sharing, so. Yeah, just so people are aware that PTFS Europe has a really comprehensive, um, uh, instructions on how to implement the transport cost matrix and I've used it when I, I've only done it once or twice and it's it's been really helpful so just if people are interested in looking at it further it's on their site and I just want to add to the con uh, the, the the transport costs matrix as well in that um Back at our Koha US conference in Erie, Pennsylvania, I did a presentation on that and I implemented that before this was before local holds priority and I and I will say that our combination of local holds priority and the uh, transport cost matrix have worked really well for our 28 libraries. Um, the transport cost matrix yes there's a lot to do to, to set it up, but once you do it. I mean, you know, even even if you're adding a library once in a while, it's not it's not horrible. Uh, it's you know, it looks overwhelming, but um, really, um, the presentation that I that I I did, I had put together some spreadsheets because yes, the transport cost matrix uh, just assigns a value and uh, to to each of the libraries going from one to another, and so it accounts for every single. Uh, combination of you know from this library to that library kind of thing but um the spreadsheets that i put together uh were designed in a way so that you could uh in factor in you know uh how often does a courier run between these particular libraries and how many days a week are these libraries open so it kind of uh tweaked the values accordingly so that uh so it would say that you know this is it, it, it's potentially going to be longer at this one not just because of distance but because of trend, uh, of how many couriers it goes through how often the couriers run and um 
you know, that kind of thing. So that's the way the spreadsheets were, were set up. And I think they're still out there. And if they're not, you can always ask me about it, but you basically you plug in this information and we, I plugged this information in a long time ago and I haven't had touched it uh, uh, much at all since then. Um, so that worked well uh, just before, you know, before we had any uh, local holds priority. I think it's important to still have that on top of local holds priority, especially now because local holds priority um, used to be, it was just an all or nothing thing. And we actually funded a, um, an enhancement on that so that you could exclude certain things from that because we did have items that were just constantly stuck at our library. We wanted to be able to share with the consortium. We have our hotspots that were highly popular, but they were only going out to our patrons. And you know, our philosophy is it's in there, we wanna share it. Um, so we wanted to be able to exclude things like that. And so we, we added that feature. And so now we can exclude those. And so it can go out to everywhere. So, and that would be kind of wonky without the local, excuse me, without the, con, the transport cost matrix uh, in the mix. I wanted to just mention, Michael, I have one that's like more Kansas specific where it's like, how many days are open? How many days a week they get courier? And um, it factors in their route, their courier routes, because we have different routes in our system. I don't know if you do. Um, so I'm happy to share that with you and anybody who wants it. And now that I'm thinking about it, I remember the reason we were a little bit hesitant about the local holds priority is because uh, it's the what I was thinking about was if there's no holds on the item, it's going to do the one at their home library first. But this also affects if there's a stack of holds. And so it's always gonna be their patrons first, correct? At their at that library, right? Okay, and so I think that was the thing that we were wanting to avoid. And part of that is there's, there's talk in our board about changing our funding model to being partly tied to sharing as how much library shares affects their funding. And so in that case, we would want it to be as um, equal and as random as possible. So there's kind of a lot of, a lot of things playing into that, but um, thank you. That gives me a lot to think about. Out of curiosity, I just did the math and, and local holds or the transportation cost matrix for you would be 2,862 separate cells that need information in it in the table. And, but there, yeah. Well, and the other thing I can add is that I've written jQuery to uh, auto-populate numbers and to make the transportation cost matrix easier to digest. Uh, it takes some setup on the jQuery end, but you can fill in a whole row uh, with a click. And Jason recommends filling out a spreadsheet and giving it to Bywater to populate. Uh, on that note, too, I did look, and there is uh, this goes back to the earlier discussion about the pain that circuit rules can be. There is a bug 31256 for circ rules batch modification. So if you could, you know, that would be a good one to comment on. I know I've talked about this before. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I went through and deleted. It was 600 and some redundant rules from our circulation rules that, that were not necessary because they were duplicates of, of all rules or one way or the other. Um, but being able to do that, I, I mean, I was doing it one row at a time because that's the only way to do it. Um, but having a way to batch modify circ rules would be an incredible um, change for us. I wanna see who, who suggested this uh, modification. Oh, it's Christopher. Yeah, I do see that there's one uh, with a request for developers re regarding public list. Uh, you can feel free to make that request in the chat or to unmute. Uh, oh, here we go. OPAC user is not able to download public list into a CSV or open document spreadsheet format. Well, if there's one thing I've taken away from this conference, if there's not a bug 
that exist, I would file that bug today. Uh, so the, that's going to be the best way for the developers to uh, see that. And then you can use a forum like this to, if, if people agree with you, to get those comments on there so it gets even more present. So uh, that would probably be my recommendation for that. We do have uh, we're, we are dwindling in our numbers here, so not as many developers as there were earlier, but uh, that's going to be a, uh, the best way to get that seen. So I would suggest uh, filing a bug on that. Uh, yeah, uh, Juliet says we also use the transport cost matrix to make the work a little bit better. And that's not something currently we're using. Uh, I'm not going to make George do the math on how many permutations there are when you have uh, over a hundred branches. Uh, so, uh, but we, we uh, uh, similarly, we want to make things as even as possible, but we also want that flexibility uh, or that efficiency, I should say that uh, the local uh, holds priority provides. So, cause I think the other thing that wasn't mentioned uh, that works well for us is it will stick in that queue. So it won't hop around to other queues, which is uh, so that that gets filled at that home branch, which is nice when it's a general request. So, so Christopher is suggesting a, a, a modification where, uh, it, where you would be able to upload a CSV to the uh, transport cost matrix. Sounds like a great idea. And I'm I'm engaged in another conversation, but I think that that there already is a bug for that to be able to modify the transportation cost matrix. I with a with a CSV, I just can't find the bug right now. If I find it, I'll post it. So I'm seeing another question. Speaking of public lists, is there a way to make public lists visible only to a particular branch library? That I do not know the answer. I wonder if there's a jQuery that could maybe uh, be done to do that, possibly. Uh, but yeah, doesn't sound like that is currently uh, an option. The only way I can think of a way that you would be able to limit public lists based on uh, a particular branch, the in in the OPAC at least the borrower would have to be logged in because otherwise there's no information about which branch you're at. So that would be the, the issue there is you would have to know which branch you're at in order to do that kind of thing with a public list. I think if you name the public list with your branch code, maybe you could be able to limit it on that. Um, one thing I've always thought is in the OPAC, it would be really nice if the public lists were a data table. And I think that there's a bug for that already in Koha. But, and again, if I can find it, I'll add it to the chat. All right. Um, any other bugs, issues, things that uh, people wanted to discuss? I think we just had a good example of kind of how this uh, operates where Somebody brings an idea and we have a pretty robust discussion around different ways that we do things, different options to make things work. This is more of a workflow question than anything else, but um, as a consortium manager, for the most part, when people email me with problems, I, I just keep the emails as kind of my way to track whether I'm working on something or not. And that works great when I don't have anything other, else going on. But um, I just had a migration this summer and I got so far behind on a lot of them that I ended up losing some of the projects I was working on. And I don't want to try and do any kind of a ticketing system, but I'm just wondering what people do to keep track of. Um, how do you keep track of issues that you're working on and prioritize them and all of that? So we do use a ticketing system. And a lot of that is because... Uh, when you have multiple people answer, available to answering questions, sometimes they copy both people on that or multiple people. And then we were finding we were both writing similar answers and sending them about the same time. And like, that's just not super efficient. But I think once we noticed, once we did the ticketing system, that uh, stuff much more rarely uh, ended up at, it lost in an email inbox. So that's, uh, so 
that is something that's worked well for us. Uh, the other thing that we do um, uh, in our group is we use Asana, which is a, there's a paid version, but there's a free version as well. And it's kind of a project management tool. And uh, we kind of use that just to manage uh, various projects. So like when we do a migration, we have a template set up with checklists already populated so that we kind of remember, oh yeah, you got to do all that stuff. Uh, so uh, we just uh, move that template over and create that specific project and then enter any dates in. And, that, and that's quite helpful. Uh, but the other thing we do is we use that kind of as a living uh, meeting agenda too. Uh, so one of the projects that we have open is actually just an open meeting agenda and the, the staff that work with me are adding items and we're, we're discussing things and then move, maybe moving them uh, to a different place or, or, uh, or closing them out if it's resolved. And, and that's been really helpful for the workflow because that was another thing I found myself spending quite a bit of time creating agendas and things like that. And, um, and a lot of it was copying and pasting. So that was another little efficiency, but I'd be curious to see how others do it. Uh, we use Zendesk as a ticketing system at Northeast Kansas Library System. And um, Zendesk, there is a cost, there's a cost per month per user but we broke it down to where we've got like a email address. Um, Robin is the one that manages Zendesk. She's the better person to ask. Um, but we have one email in our Google Suites email system that um, if, if our libraries send something to the next help email address, um, it goes to Zendesk and then um, it gets copied to all of the people that are on the that are aliases for that email address. So instead of having a bunch of users, um, we've only got one user in Zendesk, which help us, helps us keep the cost down. But there's ones for what, there's Next Help, and there's like uh, Tech and Support and Courier, right? Or Office or something like that. I think we've got four of them because four of them is the point where if we had five, the price would go up. Yeah, but then when somebody sends something to Next Help, it goes to like me and Robin. When somebody sends something to Tech, it goes to both of you, right? And support, I think, goes to you and maybe Robin too. But it's broken down that way so that it goes so that the biggest advantage of that for us is that uh, if I am busy all week at a conference, it doesn't just go to me. It goes to everybody else that's here at the conference and isn't going to answer too. <laughs> so. So that's what we use. And I don't know if there's anybody else that's got something different. Uh, hello. Oh, Lizette can go first. I was uh, just yeah. going to say my terrible and I don't recommend it, but I'm kind of a one person shop. I mean, stuff all just comes to me. Uh, I've been checking my email during the conference, which isn't good. Um, but my process is just like to write everything down on little slips of paper and then I move them around on my desk and prioritize things that way. <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend it though. Um, I was using Trello when, I, when it was just me and you can forward, each board has like an email. So you can just forward emails to it, which is really handy. So I had just set that up as like, I made it a contact in my book that was really easy to type in like AAA or something. And so I could just forward anything that needed to go on there. And you can have like up to five boards or something or 10 boards for free. There are some special things you don't get on the paid version. Um, but especially for just like one person, it works pretty well. Um, and the paid version, I don't think is that expensive. And then you can like assign specific like subtasks to different people and just have some more options there. Yeah, and I want to mention, we, we, I didn't mention we use live agents and that also, like if I get emailed, I can forward it to the system and it creates that ticket. Somebody has to go in and change the originating person in there, but that's pretty easy to do. I think Pradeep has uh, something to say. So yes, please unmute and uh, uh, go ahead, Pradeep. Yes, sir. Uh, 
hello there hello uh, yes sir uh, i am experiencing that uh, in 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 india in maharashtra uh, we have multiple languages uh, we have uh, library material in multiple languages that means in marathi in hindi in bengali and uh, uh, i have converted uh, excel to mark and uploaded it into koha but while downloading same data from koha to uh, uh, excel or any spreadsheet format uh, that unicode is missing uh, some symbols are uh, downloaded by default only english text is uh, visible but uh, unicode text is not visible in reports but it is visible in koha even it is searchable in opec also yeah uh, owens indicating to me the same advice i gave earlier that's you know the uh, filing a bug is going to be the easiest way to uh, get that uh, looked at for sure oh, okay sir okay So, um, you know, you were talking about, uh, Georgie, were you talking about you use the Zendesk? Yeah. Okay. And that's, that's more of a live chat kind of thing, right? Or is. No, Zendesk, uh, people send an email to next help and, uh, it goes into a ticketing system and it will copy myself and Robin for next help. And we've got other email addresses that copy other people, but we, there are different versions of net. Uh, there are different like levels of, there are different types of products you can get with Zendesk. And that's the one we use is entirely an email based ticketing system. Um, so we, uh, we uh, use a, uh, a ticketing system called OS tickets. And that one is actually open source. And so we don't have to pay for licensing on that, which is really nice. And then, um, so we're using like a, uh, we're using a, 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 a server host for our uh, consortium website. And on there, I was able to install OS tickets. They had a, uh, a setup, uh, a script for setting that up uh, easy enough. So uh, I had to learn a few things about tying in email and how to, to, to get that to work. But uh, and we've had some bumps over the years uh, just because of uh, the complexities of the, the email. But uh, once we got past that, it's, it's worked pretty good and we've uh, really customized it uh, to our needs. Um, it's fa in fact, we used it even more now since COVID because during COVID we were directing people to fill out a ticket if they needed renewals or if they had questions. Uh, and so a lot of our online support goes through the, the tickets and our staff support goes through those tickets. And so we can, I have three people, uh, myself included, that uh, monitoring those tickets and responding to those tickets as needed. Uh, we each respond in the areas that, uh, that are our strongest areas. And um, so, yeah, we've been using that. That's worked really well. Um, I would say too, uh, we used to try, we tried on a, trial basis uh a ways back uh live chat and never got any use out of that i, I you know we might get use out of it more these days but uh we were trying something like that and it, it just kind of bombed and we just ditched it because um to be staff would have to install a client to to monitor it and or you know the just the way they had to monitor it but the ticketing system seems a whole lot easier and better for what we want to do. And um, we've been, I would say we, I can't tell you how many um, renewals we've done through the tickets. I, I haven't done any statistics on it, but I, I've got one of our support team. He's always jumping right on those before I can even get to them. But I mean, we're doing a lot of renewals through that these days, which is really nice. It would be nice if it, if we had some way of tying in to Koha, but you know, I don't expect that to happen. But um, uh, using that for renewals has been a uh, 
a, a really helpful tool because we can set up the tickets to ask the specific questions, you know, like these are the things that we need to confirm if any of them have changed, you know, give us that information. And then we also have our uh, uh, canned responses if if they say they need to renew and they don't fill out any of that information or they're just they're just writing a general ticket and saying they want to renew, we can we can come back with a canned uh, thing. Sure, we can help you renew. This this is the information that we need, kind of thing. And then they they come back to that, and so we have a really quick uh, turnaround with those responses. So that's that's been a really handy tool. And again, that's OS tickets. And uh, in fact, um, there were some things that I was trying to tweak in the system uh, last month, and that company that that uh, creates OS tickets, I sent a, a question to and they responded right back. Uh, they're really good about getting back to you and answering questions about that that product. You know, if you if you did want to go the route of a ticketing system, which I know at the beginning you said you didn't want to do, um, OS Ticket is open source and the the product that Bywater uses uh, for their uh, bug for their uh, client support ticketing system is best practical and it's also open source. Uh, it's at bestpractical.com. Yeah, I was just curious. My, I was curious, Michael, uh, when you're done, it, 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 if it was a cost thing that was the the concern. Yeah, uh, which makes sense. That uh, often is a barrier. So we we use that for other things other than just the consortium. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, I'm seeing we've got fresh desks uh, up there as well. That was one we looked at. And then uh, George has put up the link for best practical. So, um, and OS ticket. Uh, okay, now now it's. Um, okay, great. Um, any other issues people are facing? We're getting close to the end here, so uh, we have time to maybe uh, get into another topic or two. Uh, depending on uh, depending on that, or we could just call it a conference. I have an eight-hour drive. I do want to get going. <laughs> yeah, keep keep me here. Keep me away from my family. <laughs> yes, sir. Not really. It's not really a question, it's rather some advice. If you submit a bug to Bugzilla and you um, include like test cases that this patch should uh, validate, and it's much easier to actually create that patch, at least for me. Yeah. I don't know if you already do this, but yeah. Yeah, I think the more specificity on the problem that you can add, the you know, the easier it is going to be to interpret. Um, so absolutely. So having a specific example of where it's not working. So would you recommend like a link or something like that or screenshots? Well, I was thinking about this uh, branch situation and uh, I don't think that you can encompass that in one bug, right? But for smaller stuff, if you have like um, a desi desired outcomes for certain things, right? And you formulate it in, uh, if this happens, this should, this should uh, work this way, or I don't really know how to explain it, but um, yeah, just formulate the desired outcome somehow. And then it's much easier to develop in that direction. I'm, I, I don't, I can't think of a good example right now, but. This is a comment I made a lot of times at conferences about asking for help and support tickets and sending emails to Bywater and the emails I get is there is nothing worse than getting like a support request that says this doesn't work. Um, yeah, the holds are broken. What does that mean? Um, so, and, and especially coming from librarians, most of us have some kind of training in reference uh, services 
And, you know, we're taught how to conduct a reference interview. And that's, I think, a lot of times what you have to think of when you're entering a support ticket is treat, imagine that you're doing a reference interview and you're the person asking the reference question, what's that other person going to do? The first thing they're going to do is they're going to ask you, they should, the first thing they should do is ask you clarifying questions. So when somebody comes in and say, I need a book about dogs, you don't go, well, or go to 636. You know, you ask questions to clarify it. And I think a lot of times if, if we, you know, want better help, if, if we don't want to have that 50 emails to get a, a support ticket in and get something that everybody understands, we can't just say uh, holds are broken. We have to say, you know, what I do, these are the steps that I took and this is the result I expected. And, and this is the result that I got. And, and so that's, I think, something that librarians, even though we're librarians, I think a lot of times that gets forgotten. Well, I, I do find myself, well, I often, and you will, my first response to everything is like, can you provide an example of where this is happening? And then I find myself sometimes not doing that when I do a, a ticket to buy water. And so like, I'm even guilty of that, but usually that's like when everything's not working and it's like you pick a patron this thing's not working for any of them but i still should provide an example patron every time because that gives them something they can immediately go to and test and i should know better that they're it's just going to delay because they're going to ask me to do that anyway so there's no reason to not do that at all times always have that example handy because then they, they can test that exact scenario the two most common questions that I ask back to people when they send me in a, a request for help is, could you send me a library card number and could you send me a item barcode number? Those are the two most common questions I ask. Well, two things. One, um, I get that response from him quite a bit. Give me an example. Um, in my defense, um, I started right before Armageddon with no history or experience other than working the circ desk. So I still have a lot to learn. Um, but I'm talking about the schools and trying to figure out how to do it. Is there a way to maybe put somehow in their library code that they're like, they hibernate for part of the year or they're a temporary, I, I use hibernate because I'm thinking, you know, reverse the bear, but um, like that they're somehow a temporary loan portal or something um, to where it's in their library code so that they wouldn't show up with that since that seems to be from what I'm hearing because I don't know anything that seems to be a very powerful little number <laughs> so, so there is a bug and I think maybe it was Christopher that filed it that says there should be like a thing where you could just turn a library off where you would just click a button so that currently does not exist uh, what you do have is you have a lot of different ways to get to that effect. I think the hardest thing is, and this was a bug that I had uh, uh, that I had filed, although I found this other workaround I addressed earlier that I think is going to work, where what I would like is if in the circles, I would like to check both uh, the, the patron's home library and the items library, check both circles, because right now you can pick one or the other. And that would simplify things as well, because if you wanted to close the library, you could just turn their holds off. Right now, if that's the only step I take, if it's set to looking at the circles of the home library, uh, that turns off that the, those students from being able, or the faculty from being able to request out, but then they still get requests in. So that's where you have a corresponding action, like maybe branch transfer limits or turning off the pickup location uh, in, in the library settings. So you do have to take some other action and there's, it's a little bit more complicated, but there is a way to do it. There's just not that singular thing where you can just say this library is closed. You know, um, speaking to what I've already forgotten your name, Paul said earlier about, you know, um, tickets that are really big that encompass more than can be done in, in one development. I was thinking about this. I, I shared my screen and this is a, just one example of a system preference marked. I didn't leave. It's not really, doesn't really matter what the system preference is, but there's this select all 
And then, you know, from, you know, it, there's a whole bunch of different options. So it's a drop down with a list of check boxes. And I started thinking of when we were talking about these library closure issues earlier, that what we really need to do is start with um, separate bugs for, you know, each of the things that we need to have happen and have a, a it would be really nice to have a drop down on like the library's circulation and fine rules or on the library page in the list of libraries that says, you know, this library is currently closed to lending. This library is closed to, um, to uh, pickups that, and, you know, have each one of those is a separate box with a select all at the top and then work each through each one of those as a separate development until we get to the one where we can say, click select all and it, and it knocks out all of them at once. And I think that's the kind of bug I might file next week um, that, you know, to say, make each of these different aspects, a different, a different bug. Well, that, that sounds good because it's a much more specific approach, which I think is helpful. Cause I know when I've, uh, given the big idea and talk to Biowater's developers, they just kind of like, well, we're going to think about that for a few years and then maybe get back to you on it. And yeah, it, it's so encompassing. So having more of a, a prescriptive approach that's, that we want this and this and this sounds like it would get things done a lot better. And I'm getting a lot of nods from a developer. So I think, I think uh, we're on to something here. All right, well, uh, I see Christopher looking at his watch. So uh, we technically have a couple of minutes left, but I think we can just uh, use this time to uh, thank everybody for sticking around in both on virtually and in the room. And uh, I know I was joking earlier about this being the last session, but we've had a really great robust discussion. So uh, I appreciate everybody contributing to that. and. Uh, look to the uh, listservs for and the uh, Koha US calendar for a future consortia uh, discussion in a couple of months. And hopefully we'll uh, continue all these great uh, exchanges of ideas.